Um, tonight, meanwhile, we're in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm hoping to get through six verses tonight. And we left off in chapter 2, verse 17, last week, where God was laying out the details of the treachery that the priests, the Levites specifically, and the rest of the nation uh, were doing against God's covenant. Remember, he detailed and outlined the marriage treachery that was going on. They were breaking covenants, not only the law in general, but the covenants they made with each other in marriage. And so we covered that, and God said that uh, you're going to be punished for this, you're going to be cursed for this. In verse uh, 17, at the end of chapter 2, God says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? And every time you find a question like this in Malachi, and there's plenty of them throughout Malachi, uh, it's always the the hearers, uh, they're they're trying to argue against God that he's not saying it truthfully, okay? And so he says, Wherein have we wearied him? They're not genuinely asking, Well, what's the answer, Lord? Uh, they're trying to give an excuse. You know, where do you think we've wearied you, God? Because we've done the things that you, you told us to do. And, of course, we've covered how they've done it corruptly and, and wickedly. And so he says, when you say everyone that does evil is good inside of the Lord. <clears throat> so here are these priests, and they call themselves good, and yet they're breaking the law. They're showing prejudice under the law, and they're, they're corrupting and breaking covenants. And so they call themselves good, and yet here's God calling them bad, calling them evil. And so they call what is evil good, and that's why they weary him. And so they can't even make a proper judgment between good and evil. And they're supposed to do that for not only the nation of Israel, but the rest of the world. And so he delights, uh, it says, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, the second question, which is our introduction tonight, where is the God of judgment? And so they're asking, where is the God of judgment? Meaning that we should, we're, we're, we're not doing anything wrong because God's not judging us. And they're making that determination. If we were doing something wrong, God would judge us. So where's the God of judgment? He's not going to do anything. And so if you go back to Psalm 94, you see this attitude crop up throughout Israel's history where God in his long suffering and his slowness to to punish and to judge and his uh, mercy towards Israel, uh, they'll cry out, well, he's not going to judge. He's not going to hold his word. So we're we're doing okay. Apparently we've met the standard that, that, that God requires. And of course they hadn't. Uh, Psalm 94, verse 1 says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, show thyself. And so here's the psalmist pleading for God to show himself. In Malachi 2, people are just saying he's not going to show himself. In verse 2, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render a reward to the proud. And so a lot of people like to quote these psalms in modern society, say, God, show up and judge these wicked people. When, quite frankly, you don't want God showing up and judging you. For your sins, you should praise God that Christ died for your sins and given you a privilege of operating under grace today. And Psalm 94, verse 3, he says, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? So you see, the reason why he's crying out how long is because God is long-suffering. Again, the Old Testament teaches us that, that God is merciful. Okay, we read about God's judgment back there, but you forget that it's over the span of thousands of years. And so he's, he gave a lot of time for people to repent and change their mind, and, and they would not. And so in verse 6, they slay the widow. <clears throat> uh, verse 5, they break in pieces thy people and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. So you see in verse 7, there is the attitude of these people who are doing uh, wickedness. They say God won't see it, and the God of Jacob won't regard it. He hasn't up until now. I mean, those stories are legends. They were they, were, they happened in my great grandpa's day, but not today. God isn't active today, and He's not going to judge things. As Psalm ninety four seven, uh, people are are speaking against God's word. Now today we say that we live in a time where God is not judging the world uh, based on what God said He is doing. Okay, so don't mistake this. When we say that we're we're living at peace with God and God's not judging the wicked today. It's because we read about the dispensation of God's grace to humanity. We read about how Christ, uh, God in Christ, not imputing their trespasses unto them, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of repent or perish. You know, change your mind or die. Uh, Change your mind or God's going to come back and slap you around. Uh, That's not the message we preach. We preach the gospel of the grace of God. So although sin is bad and we should not sin, and and, uh, sin will be uh, judged either on the cross or when Christ returns, uh, we don't live at the time that God has obligated himself to judge the world, okay? But Psalm 94, that was the time. And so the, the psalmist could write, God, where are you? You said you're going to judge, and you haven't. Okay, so we need to always make that dispensational, doctrinal separation there. 
So if you turn back to Malachi chapter 3, the question on Malachi 2.17 is, where is the God of judgment? And we saw in Psalm 94 the attitude of these evil priests uh, where he's not going to see, he doesn't care, he's not going to regard it. We, we're the people that he's given a special title to, and because we're those people, he's not going to regard our sins. Okay, and of course, that's false. So in the very next verse, Malachi 3.1, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger. And so God reiterates his promise that even though you've done wickedly and you haven't seen the God of judgment yet, you will, and he will come according to his promise. So Malachi 3.1 is, is one of the, the more popular Old Testament prophecies about the coming of of the Messiah because it so clearly defines the Messiah as being God and the messenger here being John the Baptist. There are at least four or five times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that reference Malachi 3.1 and saying John the Baptist is that guy and the Messiah is that guy. Okay. Unfortunately, in some other Bibles, apart from your King James, you don't have the connection because they changed some words. You don't know where it comes from. Um, hopefully you've, you've studied this thing out and, and you know the difference. But Malachi 3.1, let's read the verse here real quick, and we'll talk about all the issues contained in it. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, uh, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And so what's interesting about this verse is that there are actually two messengers in this verse. Remember back in our first lesson of Malachi, we studied how the name Malachi means messenger of the Lord? So Malachi was a messenger. Then we learned in Malachi chapter 2 that the Levites were called messengers of the Lord in Israel's Old Testament. Malachi 3, 1, here we have the two other messengers of the Lord that Malachi prophesies about. One is this messenger that's going to prepare the way before God. Okay? And the, the other one's going to be the messenger of the covenant. All right? uh, don't forget either when you read this verse, who is speaking here? One of the questions we ask when we study the scripture is who is speaking and to whom? Malachi wrote these words, but when it says, where is the God of judgment? Behold, I will send my messenger. That's not Malachi saying, I will send my messenger. That's God saying, Jehovah God, I will send my messenger. So whose messenger is it? It's Jehovah God. It's the Lord. And he shall prepare the way. Who's he? The messenger shall prepare the way before who? Me, God. Okay. So God says, I will come in judgment. And this messenger will prepare the way before me. Who? Jehovah God. Right? So in Malachi 3 1, you have a, a messenger coming before the Lord comes back. All right? And then it says, secondly, the Lord whom ye seek shall sh suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. One of these messengers is going to be the son of David, the son of Abraham, uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The other messenger is going to be a Levite. In the same strain of messengers in Malachi 2 17, when it says in Malachi 2, or not 2 17, but 2 7, rather. The priest's lips should keep knowledge. They should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Remember back there, we, we covered what the Levite's job description was and how these Levites were not being those messengers. Well, Malachi 3.1, there's going to be a messenger here that is a son of a Levite, and it's going to be John the Baptist. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 5. It is appropriate that Malachi is right next to Matthew in your Bible because uh, not all books are set up this way, but in this case it works. Malachi is chronologically before, right before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so in Luke chapter 1, we, we read here the description of the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. Many times in Israel's history, when God needs something done, he gets it done. Okay? And so he doesn't need uh, humanity to, to fulfill his purposes. Uh, he intervenes and gets it done. So here we have another example in Israel's history of a barren woman, and, and, and God intervenes to... To allow, um, to, to allow a conception. But Luke chapter 1, down to verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Now, to be a priest, you had to be a Levite. Uh, to be a priest among the Levites, you had to be a son of Aaron. That's what it says here. Of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, verse 6, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So here, unlike the priests in Malachi chapter 2, we have a priest and his wife who are righteous, doing what is right. Not only in just offering the incense, but in their heart, which was the point of Malachi 2, okay, their faith. So Luke chapter 1 verse 7 says they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. That sounds a lot like Abraham, doesn't it, back there? Where they're stricken in years and barren, and hey, God's not going to fulfill any promises, and whoa, there he is. 
So here's Malachi 2 saying, where's God of judgment? The next thing that happens is here's this barren wife and a righteous priest, and God intervenes and brings, behold, the messenger. Malachi 3 verse 1. Okay? And so if you drop from Luke 1 down to verse 13, we're going to skip the story. No doubt you've read it before, uh, where the angel comes to Zacharias and all that. And verse 13 says, The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, thou shalt call his name John. Uh, if you skip all the way down to verse 76, we're skipping a lot of interesting material here. But uh, no doubt again, you've heard the story where John the Baptist, uh, or not John the Baptist, his dad Zacharias, uh, becomes mute. The angel mutes him, so he can't speak until John's born. And then when John's born, they're asking, oh, we're going to name this kid. And suddenly his voice comes back. He says, we're going to call it John, because that's what the angel told me to call it. And in Luke 1, he starts prophesying, filled with the Spirit here, about John the Baptist and who he is and why he's so special. And he says at the end of his prophecy uh, about the coming Messiah and about salvation coming to Israel and about how God's going to remember his promises, that thou child, speaking about John the Baptist, and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So Malachi 3, 1, remember it said, Behold, my messenger comes before me. Right? Before who? Jehovah God. God's going to come. The messenger comes before him. Well, here's Zechariah saying, Here's the prophet of the highest, who's my son, who's going to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, right? to give knowledge of salvation unto his people, Israel, by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness, and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts to the day of his showing unto Israel. So you have there the birth and the miraculous birth and the prophecy about John the Baptist being the fulfillment of Malachi 3.1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are extremely important, contain extremely important material for Israel because all of the prophets spoke of those days. And so how will they know that Jesus is the Messiah without seeing the messenger that came before him and all the prophecies that happened about him? Okay, so it's so very important that that happened. Uh, that's not written there to start a new denomination. It's not written there to say, hey, that guy is where the church begins. It's written there as a fulfillment of Malachi 3.1, as a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40. Look over in Luke chapter 7, verse 25. Luke 7, 25. We see here, we're not going to cover all the material here, but Jesus identifies John, who was, by the way, his cousin, uh, John, as the guy in Malachi 3, Luke 7, 25. He says uh, in verse 24, what went, ye out to, uh, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Soft raiment, you know, uh, velvet, that sort of thing, you know, nice expensive raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So he quotes Malachi 3.1 and says that guy is the guy. There, there, there's rarely a, a more clear prophecy, a prophecy and a connection than Malachi 3.1 to what God said would happen and what's going on here. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's interesting. Now, when you turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 2, there's such a clear connection between John the Baptist being that messenger. But remember, we, we made a big deal a few minutes ago about how in Malachi 3, 1, it's the messenger, John the Baptist, who's going to prepare the way before the Lord, before God, right? In Mark 1, verse 2, notice what Mark does here when he quotes Malachi and assigns the preparation of the way to Jesus Christ. And so John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Isn't that, in fact, the way you've been taught it, that John the Baptist is preparing the way to Jesus Christ? Well, Malachi 3.1 says he's preparing the way for God. And so this is a messianic prophecy in Malachi 3.1, proving that Jesus is God, okay? And so when you start messing with the connections, it really causes some problems. And uh, what you see in Mark 1, verse 1, is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, how do you know he's the Son of God? As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Okay? Now, I've got here in front of me a parallel Bible, which has um, the, the, the best translations out there today, which is the NIV, uh, the old one, by the way, not the new, new NIV, the old, new NIV. 
uh, the NASB, the King James, the New Living Translation. And I've got a bookmark here to Mark chapter 1, verse 2. And what you find in Mark 1, verse 2, and every other translation except for the King James, unfortunately, is in verse 2 it says, It is written in Isaiah the prophet. Okay? And it goes on in NIV, it says, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. That's a prepare your way. And so it doesn't say before thee, as in Malachi 3, 1, when God said before me, God. It removes the two words that make the connection that Jesus is God of Malachi 3, verse 1. So you see that that's, that's interesting. Not only that, but it gets it wrong about who's talking. The NIV, the NASB, New Living, every, all, all three parallels here says in the book of the prophet Isaiah it's written. In the book of the prophet Isaiah it's written in Isaiah. Well, we've been covering Malachi 3, 1. It's Malachi, not Isaiah. That's why your King James Bible says it's written in the prophets. Now, this is not a problem of stupid translators. Okay? The problem here, and this is, I'm just going to spend a minute or two on this, and the problem here is that they're translating different things. So it's not a matter of who's smarter than the other guy. It's a matter, in this case, of which thing did you translate. If you translate one thing, it's going to say prophets, as the context is very clear, it's prophets. But if you're going to be uh, persuaded that the oldest manuscript is the best, then you're going to translate it wrongly, no matter how good a translator you are, because that one says Isaiah, not the prophets. And that's wrong, because Mark 1, verse 2 is not Isaiah, it's Malachi. Okay, so here's, here's an indication where there's a clear error in other Bibles. It, it, it's not true. It's not Isaiah, it's Malachi, and there's two words missing from it. Okay, so just be aware of that. That's a good, good verse to show people that it's not about, you know, who's smarter than the other guy and who knows more languages. It's just a matter of reading the context here, which one's right and which one's wrong. Okay? Because we don't want mistakes in the Bible. That's the point. God's word is true. And so we're going to preserve it that way. Meanwhile, that's just for your, your benefit in the parenthetical statement there, Mark 1, verse 2. And verse 3 is Isaiah, by the way. Mark 1, 3. When he says it's written in the prophets, he quotes Malachi and says, My, mess my messenger shall... Uh, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, Jesus Christ. And in Malachi 3, it's before God, making Jesus the Son of God. But in Mark 1, 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And of course, that, of course that's quoting Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3 through 5, where Isaiah says the same thing, that the Lord will come, and this messenger is going to prepare the way of that Lord. Okay. Again, proving that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the first three verses in Mark chapter 1. Okay. Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3, says, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We covered the highway uh, back in Obadiah. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. When the king comes... Uh, you, you pick up all the trash. When the king comes, you want to make sure there's nothing in the road, no big rocks for, for his chariot to, to stumble over. You get all the rocks out, okay? You make them straight, you make them flat, you make them clean. And spiritually, of course, he's talking about the people, about they need to get all the obstacles of sin out of the way, else he's going to come and judge them, okay? So Isaiah 40, verse 5, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, what's interesting about these prophecies, and we'll see this in Malachi 3, 1 as well, about becoming messengers, is that it seems to talk about becoming of the Lord to set up his kingdom. It seems to talk about the coming of God to establish his kingdom on the earth in Israel. And yet, here we are in 2013, and God hadn't done that yet. But we were just reading a moment ago, John the Baptist has come already, and Jesus Christ came already. So what we're seeing is that there's two things being talked about in these prophecies. There's the first coming of the Lord, and there's another coming of the Lord that hasn't yet happened yet in a big span of time in between. The prophets back here did not understand that. They did not see the dispensation of grace and did not understand even the difference between Jesus' coming the first time and his going away and coming again. That's what Jesus kept trying to tell the people in his earthly ministry, his disciples specifically, I'm going away and I'm going to come back. And he said, this is a mystery that you know the prophets didn't know. I'm giving it to you disciples, to the apostles. Okay? So not only were they ignorant of the dispensation of grace and the mystery information, but they were ignorant of the timing of when these things would happen. All they did was wrote these things down because God told them to do it. And so here he is preaching Isaiah 40, verse 3, Isaiah, that here's going to be a messenger crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. And we read John the Baptist doing that. And Jesus says, that's the guy. But we don't see verse 5 happen. 
the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. That didn't happen. They nailed him to a cross. He resurrected, and there were more than 500 people that saw him resurrected, but not all the flesh saw it together. In fact, Jesus himself said that when he comes back again, his coming will be like lightning from the east to the west. Everybody will see. Right? So Jesus himself said, Isaiah 45, it was not fulfilled. So we need to be discerning. We need to be able to even rightly divide prophecy when we're reading about it. When you say, well, what is that talking about, and when is that going to happen? It's important. We can't just take every verse and say, well, since, since that's John the Baptist, we've got to twist verse 5 to make it be what Je happened when Jesus is at the ministry. And that's what happens with so many uh, commentators of the Bible who don't rightly divide. Okay, they, they try to, to push everything back into Jesus' earthly ministry because they see partial fulfillment. And so we need, we need to be uh, privy to that, I suppose. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 3, meanwhile, says he's going to prepare the way the Lord make the path straight. He's going to be preaching in the wilderness. We see that in Matthew chapter 3, uh, the first 12 verses there, where John the Baptist fulfills this. And in Matthew 3, 1, it says he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, repent being a change of mind, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the end of God's promise to Israel is going to come down and it's going to be fulfilled. For this is that which is spoken of the prophet Isaiah, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, which is what we just read in Isaiah. In verse 4, the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And so verse 4 is the same thing that Elijah wore and the same thing that Elijah ate back there in the Old Testament. We're going to cover that more in chapter 4 of Malachi. But he went out to Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around about Jordan were ba and baptized people in the Jordan with water, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now God had not poured out his wrath in Israel for quite a while. In fact, he'd been silent, not sending a prophet at all for 400 years. And here comes John the Baptist. He's water baptized. Here comes the Pharisees. And he goes, vipers, who are you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, couldn't these people just respond with Malachi 2.17? Where's the God of judgment? He hasn't come for hundreds of years. Now, you're saying he's going to come now? So you see the context of Malachi 2 and 3 fits right into Matthew chapter 3. It's as if it's happening the next day. When actually there's 400 years separation there. Okay? The point being that God is faithful. He will not forget what he said he would do. His promises, whether they be good or bad, he won't forget. And so if you go, go back to um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, that be John the Baptist. He shall prepare the way before me, which means he's going to correct all the wrongs. He's going to call out the sins and, and teach people righteousness. He's not going to be a wicked priest. He's going to, according to Malachi 2, 7, in his lips will be knowledge. In his lips will be the law. And he'll teach it. And he'll preach it. In Malachi 3, 1, it says, And the Lord, uh, whom ye seek, shall, shall suddenly come to his temple. Now, the whom ye seek there is proof that God is sarcastic. Okay? And this happens throughout the Bible. Sometimes God says things quite a bit, and he's sarcastic. And, and what, what that means is that he's saying that they're seeking the Lord. Well, how are they seeking the Lord? Because they say, where's the God of judgment? Right? Where's he at? You know, come on back. You know, But they don't really want him to come back. Because we'll learn in Malachi 3, verse 2, when he comes back, who shall stand? They're going to be judged if he actually does. And so he says, and the Lord whom ye seek. No doubt these evil, wicked priests don't want the God of righteousness to return, but they're crying out, who, where is he? When's he going to come back? Okay, in mockery. And so it says, whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Um, it says that whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So verse 1 here, the whole theme is that he will come. He will come. We need to be able to rightly divide, of course, we're reading these prophecies, what will happen when he comes. Uh, we were reading in Isaiah. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 61, we've covered this, this verse comparison before in Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. You study the scripture by comparing it with scripture. And when you know how to rightly divide, meaning you know the progressive revelation of God's instructions throughout time, you're able to piece together what he means, comparing line with line. The scripture is not something that's hard to understand. It takes some effort, though, to study it. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, if you're reading this, you're seeing that there's going to be a Savior come, and at the same time, this Savior is going to give vengeance. He's going to revenge. He's going to judge. And yet, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, stands up in the synagogue, down in, in verse uh, 16, and he reads Isaiah chapter 61, and he says, this is fulfilled in your ears this day. But Luke 4, verse if you drop down to verse uh, 18 and 19, you see in verse 19 that Jesus stops reading before he gets to the part about vengeance. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. He's just quoting Isaiah 61. Verse 19 says, And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book in verse 20. Well, he closed the book on a comma. Okay, Isaiah 61 there's a comma there. It says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, the day of vengeance of our God. Apparently, there's 2,000 years where that comma sits. Okay? You wouldn't know that by reading Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Right? But God fulfills his promises, and Jesus says part of that verse is fulfilled, the other part isn't. So again, just a, another good evidence of the Bible when you're studying prophecy, just because it's in the same verse, just because it's in the same chapter, doesn't mean it has to be fulfilled at the same time. Right? It's a dispensational issue. And so people will go back there and quote a whole chapter and say, all of this is talking about Jesus' earthly ministry. When it wasn't. Jesus himself said it wasn't. Okay? So again, be careful of, of when you're trying to nail down these fulfillments. And this is important because of Malachi 3. Because we're seeing fulfillment in Malachi 3 in Jesus' ministry. But we're also seeing things in Malachi 3 that weren't fulfilled. What do we do with those? Do we throw them out? Do we spiritualize them? Or do we say, well, those aren't fulfilled yet. They will be in the future, apparently. Or there must be something else. Okay? And so that's how you take the Bible at its word. Okay? Um, back in, in Malachi chapter 3, you know, Peter says this, by the way. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 1.11 that the prophets did not understand the salvation that would come to Peter and his group. They didn't understand the things Jesus was going to talk to them about, about his leaving the earth and coming back again. In 1 Peter 1, Peter talks <laughs> at a time when Jesus is gone. When he had come the first time, and the messenger came preparing his way, and, the mess and then the messenger of the covenant came, and he even came and died to institute the new covenant, but then he left. And he did not come delivering vengeance. He didn't come delivering the wrath in Malachi 4. So Peter says those prophets apparently did not know the timing of these things. No, they did not know what manner of time, he says, that the sufferings and the glory should follow. They thought they were all in the same time. Okay, They weren't. And so Peter in 1 Peter 1.11 talks about that. Now, Malachi 3, when it says here, the messenger of the covenant, that's the second messenger in the verse, and that is not the messenger of John the Baptist. This here is the messenger of the covenant whom Israel as a nation is seeking after, right? They're wanting this Savior to come to set up God's king, promised kingdom on the earth. And it says, when the Lord comes whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. So this is the Messiah, the, the God coming to the temple God instructed them to build. Even the messenger of the covenant uh, whom ye delight in. He shall come, saith the Lord. Now, when it says he shall, shall suddenly come to his temple, uh, the suddenly there, that's the, he's going to come back in judgment. That suddenly there is that he doesn't care if he has an invitation or not. That's he's going to come to his temple. Which obviously, what's going on in this temple, Malachi chapter 1 and 2, is not something worthy of God. Okay, He says, I don't want your sacrifices. He says, you're not my Levites. He says, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to cut you off. Well, this isn't exactly what God wants in this temple. So when it says he'll suddenly come to his temple, we can find verses. We can find where he'll come back and he'll make it his. He says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He'll march into Jerusalem and he'll purify Israel. And he'll mark those that are his and he'll kill those that are not. And he'll purge all of the, the evil and the wickedness out of his nation and his temple. Okay. And so if you look over at uh, Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. Just to the left of Malachi, Zechariah. So Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. It says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. You couldn't call it a city of truth in the days of Malachi. Uh, he, he's saying even the priests are wicked. They're not preaching the truth. And so it's not representation of, of the God of truth. But he says, when the Lord comes to Zion, 
when Malachi 3, the messenger of the covenant, suddenly comes to his temple, it'll be called a city of truth in the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. So it won't be called the corrupt mountain, only called those people who are trying to, to, to create their own religion. It'll be called the holy mountain. Okay, look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. We covered this back in our Obadiah study. And verse 3 is worthy of uh, considering when it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Jesus didn't do that a day of his earthly ministry. Right? So Zechariah 14, 3 is not fulfilled yet. But he'll go forth and fight against those nations. God will. As when he fought in the day of battle, referring back to Exodus when, in Numbers, when God delivered Israel from their enemies. In verse 4, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And people say, well, that must be when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives in his earthly ministry. But it can't be, because look at the verse. Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. That didn't happen. Okay? Shall cleave in the midst thereof, and uh, toward the east and the, toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, half toward the south. And it goes on to describe a great earthquake and everything else. That didn't happen. I don't believe the jargon from folks who will say, well, that cleaving is a spiritual cleaving, so he came to separate the wicked from the righteous, and, and there were those Pharisees, and then there was the, the remnant and you know, the church, and that's not what he's talking about here. Okay, These are literal earthquakes, literal mountains. He's going to come back and change the geography. He's going to judge these people. Okay, And so well, let's look at Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43. Now, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 is very interesting because, and it really causes some uh, problems for those who want to spiritualize all these prophecies because God spends eight chapters detailing a temple that doesn't exist, that's never existed, by the way. Why would God do that? Now, back in Exodus, you can read about him detailing the, the, the ornaments and the, and the cloths and, and, and the, 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 the graphs on the temple that they were to build. But in Ezekiel 40 through 48, it details the, the, the operations of the priests, the temple, the land separations among the tribes that has never existed, ever, okay? So Ezekiel 40 through 48 is describing a future temple, describing a future time when God will establish, as Malachi 3, 1 says, he'll come to his temple and he'll establish his holy mountain. Let's read Ezekiel 43, uh, just in verse uh, verse 1 and 2. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looks toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And so we covered that back in Obadiah, that the way that the Messiah would return would be from the south and then to the east, and he'd come into Jerusalem that way, from the east. Ezekiel 43, verse 2. His voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Th this isn't what happened when Jesus came the first time. They couldn't recognize him. He was just, an, he was just a fish, he was just a guy. He was a carpenter, right? He was a, an average guy. He had to speak with his words and show with his works who he was. In this time, he won't have to speak anything. They'll see this guy, the glory of this guy, just like Peter, James, and John did on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was up there and it appeared Moses and Elijah with him, and his, his raiment was whiter than anybody can get with, with tide. Right? That's what it says. Ezekiel 43, verse 3 says, It was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chebar. And so let's move on to verse 4 here. The glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate of the east. Verse 5. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And so here we have God's glory filling a temple. right? Just as it did back in the wilderness when God's glory came down and Moses was there and it filled the tabernacle in the wilderness. And in verse 6. I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. And the man stood by me. Now, if I three once says the messenger of the covenant will come into suddenly come into his temple, right? Well, you say Jesus went into the temple. He threw out the money changers. Did he ever his glory fill the temple? No, it didn't. Did he ever say this is my holy mountain? It didn't happen. Okay, he was killed by the very people inhabiting that temple. Okay, Ezekiel forty three six. Here he is, the glory of God's in the temple now, and he's speaking to him out of his house. And verse 7, he says unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. So here he is, here's God, 
inhabiting, where he destined to inhabit of the children of Israel. He's going to dwell there. It's going to be in this temple. And out of that glory, he speaks, they're not going to defile this anymore. Okay? You couldn't say that about Jesus' earthly ministry. They kicked him out of the temple. He left the temple, and there they are defiling it even more. Okay? But here at this time, the glory of the Lord comes in. As Zechariah 14, 4, the mountain cleaves. He, he walks into the temple. His glory fills the temple. And he says, they're not going to defile it anymore. This is mine forever. Okay? This is, by the way, describing, of course, that millennial kingdom uh, when the Messiah comes back, conquers the nations, and he's going to purify Israel. Let's go back to Malachi chapter 3 and finally get past uh, verse 1 here. There's so much to these verses that we, there's a reason why there's so much prophecy back here in the Old Testament that we can compare these things with. Malachi 3, verse 2. It says they delight in the coming of this messenger, and then uh, they're seeking this messenger. In verse 2, we ask the question, but who may abide the day of his coming? You want this guy to come, but who's going to be able to stand in that day? Right? He's going to come, and he's going to come back in vengeance. That's what Malachi 3 is warning about. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And so we have here uh, a refinement. We have here a cleansing. A fuller's, uh, someone who washes uh, clothes and that sort of thing. A refiner's the, the guy who you know, purifies the gold and the silver to get down to the pure metal. And so you have here a purification, a cleansing of who? Israel. Uh, cleansing of who? The priests. Okay? You have a purification going on. Now in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, it says, The fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tries the hearts. And so what's going on here is God's making a judgment about the hearts of these people and whether or not they have a heart to serve him. Remember, the just shall live by their faith, right? Whether they have the faith to obey their covenant. He's not judging whether or not they're sinless and perfect. I mean, nobody can come to that standard. There's a difference between having faith to do what God instructs and the people who are just trying to do what God instructs on the outside so they can get away with their sins on the inside. See, there's that wickedness. There's that empty, hollow inside that Jesus talked about. Uh, the whited sepulchre. So in, in Malachi 3, 2, he's talking about a fuller soap, a refiner's fire, uh, being the coming of this messenger of the Lord. In verse 3 of Malachi 3, he says, He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer the Lord an offering of righteousness. God is concerned with a pure people, right? He's concerned with a pure work. Uh, and Israel, who was set up as God's earthly people in a nation, through whom all the nations of the world will be blessed, he promised that they would bless the nations. The only way they can be that channel is if they're sanctified, is if they're pure to do it. God made covenants of works with them. The only way they can fulfill that is if they do the works. And of course, we've learned already through Paul's epistles that they can't do it on their own. The Old Testament was insufficient. They needed something else. They needed God to do it in them. Right? So the New Testament, of course, promised that to have that Holy Spirit causing them to keep God's commandment. Right? Something very different than what God has done to us today under grace. But Malachi 3, verse 3 and 4, we learn, or 2 and 3 rather, we learn that this, this coming of the Lord is going to be uh, a fiery thing. It's not going to be a pleasant thing. So Amos talks about how those who are looking forward to the day of the Lord are kind of silly and foolish because that day is going to be a, a day of burning, a day of vengeance. John the Baptist even preached this message in Matthew 3 when he says that I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And all the Pentecostals go, yippee, we want that tongue of fire. You know, but no, you don't. That fire is Malachi 3, 2, and 3, where he's going to come back and refine you and try you, try your heart. And if your heart is found wanting, you're burnt up. You're cut off and thrown to everlasting judgment. Okay? And so you see the, the, the fear there. Uh, by the law program uh, that's coming through Malachi 3, uh, 2, and 3. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah, we saw seen before the last couple of weeks, Isaiah has some of the same themes that uh, Malachi deals with. In Isaiah chapter 1, we'll drop down to verse 18. Uh, well, we'll start in verse 16. Isaiah 1 is where God tells Israel, this is before their captivity, before Jerusalem is destroyed, and God's warning them even here to clean up the rack because they're offering sacrifices, and he calls them vain. He's, just like in Malachi, he says, you're, 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 you're not doing it right, you're not doing it of faith, and you're corrupt, you're wicked, you've got sins, and you're not confessing them. And so he says, I don't want your, your holidays, I don't want your sacrifices. He says in verse 16, wash 
ye, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And people love to quote this and say, oh, there's the blood of Jesus right there. Right? Uh, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The red here is sin. Okay? And the cleansing is what they need to do by their righteous works. And if they don't get it done by their righteous works, there will be a refiner, there will be a fuller who will wash them clean with fire. Okay? Don't want that. <laughs> All right? Isaiah, if you read down in verse 19, chapter 1, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. This is what we're talking about, Malachi 3. The sword, the fire, destruction. He says, How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it. But now, murderers, thy silver is become dross. You see that the same thing. Malachi says it's a refiner. It's going to refine the silver. Isaiah says the city was silver. It was pure. It, was, it reflected God's glory. But now it's become dross. It's the waste part. Apparently we need to refine it again to get that silver out. We need to burn it up. It's going to face some judgment. So the silver's become dross, thy wine mixed with water, diluted. The princes are rebellious, the companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts, the bribes, follows after rewards, follow the money, right? They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries, and avenge me of mine enemies, and will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. Which is another way of saying, I'm going to cut all those bad things out of you, right? I'm going to burn them up, right? Not a pleasant thing. And yet, what happens after God does this? Well, what's left will be pleasing to God. And the offering will be made in righteousness. Because he burned out all the dross and burned up and destroyed all the tin. Look at Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3. By the time you get to Isaiah chapter 4, he's prophesied already about God's fiery vengeance purifying Israel. In Isaiah 4, verse 3, says, It shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, <laughs> he that is left, because <laughs> there were people in Zion before, and he called them dross. And he said, I'm going to burn them up, and uh, I'm going to die. And whoever's left in Zion, the remnant, can we say that, the remaining? He that remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Why is he called holy? Because he's been purified, right? The Lord tries the hearts, and his heart has been tried. So Isaiah 4, verse 3, every... Uh, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. So if you're not among the living, uh, it means you're dead. And that's because you face God's fiery judgment. Verse 4, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. You see that? So Isaiah 4, 3, and 4 talks about God's fiery judgment. And uh, the only people that survived this are called the remnant, the remaining, those whose hearts can be pure. Right? This is why Jesus in his earthly ministry, he comes, he's preaching the coming vengeance in the future. He doesn't come to do it then. And he has those following him, people of a pure heart. He has those people following him by faith. Whatever you ask will be given to you. He gives them supernatural powers to protect them from the judgment to come. Okay? Protect them from the scorpions and whatever you read back in Revelation. Protect them from the poisonous waters. To protect them from the fiery judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so you have that remnant protection in Jesus' earthly ministry. And that's what you see in Isaiah 4, 3, and 4 as well. Okay. Let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 9. There's plenty of verses back in the Old Testament dealing with God's purifying of Israel so that he can fulfill his promise to bless the world through them. He will not use a corrupt thing to bless people. That was the lesson of the law. right? That's why you can't use your old man, by the way. That's why you've been crucified with Christ and your old man's dead. Now you're still living with it, but that thing's not going to heaven. right? You in Christ is going to heaven. That's it. He's not going to use that old man. You're dead to sin. He hates it. All right? He killed it in you. He hasn't, it hasn't become accepted in him. Okay, you're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, in Israel, they've got to stay down here. They're, they're going to reside on the earth. And so he's got to purify them through his covenant. Um, or in Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter 9. People love to talk about the mark of the beast and how whoever takes the mark of the beast is going to face God's uh, judgment over there because they've taken the Antichrist mark, right? 
Um, not knowing that before the beast marks his people, God marks his people with a mark. And so the beast, uh, like, like everything else the devil does, is just copycatting what God does in order to fool people. Okay. In Ezekiel chapter 9, we see here the reason why God marks his people in Revelation. In verse 4 through 6, the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, uh, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. There's going to be people and wicked dross-filled Jerusalem that cry for, where are you, Lord? Come back and get rid of these people, you know. They're, they're crying this covenant. They're the ones that God's trying the hearts, and they're facing the tribulation and saying, we're waiting, Lord, come back, you know. He's going to mark those people as his, and it says in verse 5, and the others, he said in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Those who have the mark of God are preserved, and those who don't are smitten, they're killed. Okay. And so we see that in Ezekiel 9, 4, and 5, that God preserves those that are his, and it's based on their heart. It's based on their heart's cry, which is the Old Testament phrase. Okay. The, jump, jump over to chapter 20, Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20, verse 17. It's not just wicked Israel that's going to go through this refinement. We see in Ezekiel 9 that uh, uh, in the midst of wicked Jerusalem are the remnant, right? They go through the refining as well, and they come out silver. They come out gold. So it, the issue is whether or not you're going to come out of it, not whether you're going to be in it at all. Very different from what Paul tells us when he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1 that we are delivered from the wrath to come and that we're at peace with God. And he talks about us being changed in the twinkling of an eye to reside in heavenly places. So, see, th there's no issue with the church, the body of Christ, going through this prophesied tribulation, which is a refinement of God's earthly people. Okay? So, in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 17, we see here again how uh, God is going to bring back and gather all of Israel, and then he's going to filter them out, the wheat from the chaff, right? And Ezekiel 20, verse 17, Nevertheless, mine eye... Uh, mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness, talking about Israel back in the past there. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither deserve their judgments, uh, observe their judgments, nor defile your, uh, yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They walk not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments, uh, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. This is a description of Malachi, the priest there. This is a description of almost every rebellious generation in Israel. Okay, God said to do the commandments, and they didn't. Right? And so it says here, I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen. Let's read that again. I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen in whose sight I brought them forth. And so what God does is he purifies and brings judgment on his people, but he always holds back at the end. He never destroys them entirely. Why is this? Why is it that he judges Israel and always holds back in the end? It's going to be because God had made a promise to these people, right? And that's why they're not consumed. If you drop down to verse uh, 34, the same chapter, it says, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. <laughs> this is a fearful God, isn't it? I mean, this is not the, the shepherd, you know, come on, I'm going to cobble you a little bit. This is the guy who say, you get over here, and here's my arm of fury, you know. You're going to do what I say. So he gathers them up, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, verse 35, and there will I plead with you face to face. And, and when God is pleading with you, that's a pretty hard place to be in, okay? Um, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. Now, how did he plead with their fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt? He let them die. He said, you either do this or you're going to die. You do this, you're going to be cut off. Remember that guy picking up sticks on the Sabbath day back in the wilderness? He got killed for picking up sticks for breaking on the Sabbath day. He pleaded with them, and they broke his law. And just like back then, he's going to do it here in verse 36. Like I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness, in verse 37, I will cause you to pass under the rod, 
and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge out from among you the rebels. Wouldn't that be great, right? If God would just come to our nation and just purge out all the wicked people, and all you got left are Republicans, you know, whatever it is. You know, just purge them all out, right? Ezekiel 20, verse 38. Well, it's not talking about us, of course. It's talking about Israel. But I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And so when they see God purging the nation of Israel and it gets rid of the rebellious, and what you see left is a holy nation like God promised in Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, that's when you will know the God of Israel is the Lord God Almighty, right? You know how hard is it sometimes to convince people that the church, the body of Christ, is what God is doing today? Because everyone else looks at us and they say, hypocrites, <laughs> look at those people. Do you call that God's holy people? Right? It's going to be God's, it's going to be the comeuppance of everyone else in the world when God actually does that in a nation he built. It says, that's, that bears my name, Israel. And those are my people and they're holy. And he's going to make them pure. He's going to do it by force. Okay? We get God's grace. We don't get all the physical blessings Israel has. But we have God's grace. So we go to heavenly places freely. Right? So in, anyway, Ezekiel 20, verse 38 there. God's going to purge out the rebels. Drop down to verse 40 in the same chapter. After he does this, after he purges Israel, what remains is holy, and their offerings will be holy. For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. All of them. Say, today's Israel is God is fulfilling a prophecy. God's bringing them back to the land. I don't think so. As, you know, it's a small percentage of people even claim to be Messianic Jews. Whatever that means. Are they saved? I don't know. They think Jesus is the Messiah, but do they know the gospel of the grace of God? Who knows? But Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 40 says, All of them will serve me. There will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. Oh, well, that can't be taken literally. We all know Jesus Christ was the final sacrifice. There's never going to be a sacrifice ever again. Right? Not true. Okay? Jesus Christ is the only efficacious sacrifice to pay for people's sins. But there will be offerings to the Lord in the future. Okay, what an arrogant statement to say that nobody's going to offer anything to the Lord ever again. Jesus offered it all. So apparently in eternity, you're going to sit with your hands in your pockets going, yep, there I am. Jesus did it all, you know. Praise God for that. But on the earth, they're going to offer offerings daily to the king of kings on the earth. Okay, to honor him. So Ezekiel 20, verse 40 here, it says that they're going to... They're, they're going to Offer things, they're going to give first fruits, and uh, with all your holy things, he says in verse 41, I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And so we've covered Ezekiel 20 here for the last 10 minutes and uh, we learned how God's going to purge this nation. When he does that, they're going to offer things holy. They're going to do it right, finally. What's left is going to be the salvation of Israel. They're going to be saved from their enemies. They're going to be saved from internal corruption and wickedness. They're going to be saved from sin, right? The whole package. They're going to get it. They don't have it yet. Okay, They're going to get it in the future. And so you see how even the prophets talk about this future salvation to Israel. So when we go back, and, and you always got in the back of your mind what God's done for you by, by his grace, and we talk about people being saved today. Are you saved today? That would be ridiculous to talk like that to an Israelite, because their salvation meant all the rebels would be gone. Their salvation meant it'd be all holy. And that's obviously not what's going on today. But we, you and I can talk about me being saved, you being saved, that guy being saved, because Christ paid for all of our sins, and it's a finished, done deal being offered to you freely. Okay, So again, we see the difference of terminology here between prophecy and what Paul describes in the mystery. Okay? Israel's salvation is yet future because that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Malachi 3 hasn't been fulfilled yet. Some of it has, but not all of it. Yeah. Right? And so we need to, again, make that distinction when we study, study prophecy. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and just get an idea. You say, didn't Peter and James and John, didn't they understand that those things uh, weren't to be taken literally? Well, no, they didn't. <clears throat> Peter asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Peter wanted salvation now. He wanted the kingdom now. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Peter, uh, 1 and 2 Peter, both of those epistles are written to the remnant of Israel, those that would be preserved through the fiery tribulation and would come out silver and gold. 
And he, Peter's trying to encourage them to take the suffering and endure to that end to receive their salvation. 1 Peter 1, 7. He says, um, in verse 6, Greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. You should rejoice, Peter says, even though you uh, have temptations, you have tribulations, you're heavy. Okay. Verse 7 says, It's the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter's talking to a people who are going through a refinement. And he says, rejoice, because you're going the right way. Jesus Christ has come. You followed him as the Messiah, and you're being tried. True, that's, that's, that's hard stuff. But you're going to come out gold and silver. And so he says, you're going to come out to praise and the honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know what? You're accepted in the beloved right now, and it's to the glory of God's grace right now that you are saved. You're not waiting for some future coming of the Lord to give glory to God through your salvation. They're waiting for a future salvation. Okay? Down to verse 13. It says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. They're waiting for a future salvation. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 covering all these prophecies about what God's going to do to Israel and the remnant being created out of Israel and hopefully that opens some doors for you when you read Hebrews to Revelation because that's the people who are going to be preserved. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. People read that and they, they make it all spiritual. Oh, fiery trial. You know, that's, that's people persecuting today for what you believe. You know, fiery trial. That's prophetic language. It has to do with God's fire of refinement coming on these people. Okay? He says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. Didn't we learn earlier? And now that the glory hasn't been revealed yet. It's going to be in the future. When the glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also. You can be glad now, saved by God's grace according to the mystery of Christ. They didn't understand the mystery in 1 Peter. If you look down in verse 1 Peter 4, verse 17, the time is come, Peter says, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So who's going to be saved at this judgment at the house of God? The righteous. Right, And Peter asks the very question that Paul answers according to the mystery of Christ when he says, how's the ungodly going to be saved? Paul says, God will save the ungodly by their faith in what Christ did on the cross. What's 4 5? In this dispensation. Right? The time Peter's talking about, he's talking about those who will be looked at according to their obedience to the commandments or not. Of course, with their, their faithful obedience to it or not. And they'll be purified on the earth by these things. James talks about it as well in James chapter 1, verse 12, when he says that those who face temptation, right, uh, you'll, if you face temptation and endure the temptation, you'll receive the crown. James 1, 12. Uh, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Revelation chapter 2 deals with that as well. Revelation 2 talks about uh, those going through the tribulation. It says if you endure the tribulation, then you'll receive a crown. Okay? Matthew 24, verse 13 says if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. Jesus taught about the coming tribulation in Matthew 24 and all the, 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 the horrible things that would befall them, talking to his faithful remnant of Israel, right? They'll hate you, they'll kill you, they'll bring you before synagogues, bad things are going to happen, and yet if you endure to the end, you will be saved. Why does he say that? When our gospel today is, trust what Christ did on the cross for you, and you'll be saved. Right? Trust in his death and resurrection, you'll be saved. Jesus said, if you endure to the end of the tribulation, you'll be saved. That's prophetic language. We've read it in Isaiah 4. God's going to purify his people, and if they are still there at the end, salvation's coming, because they're going to be holy. Okay? So you, you can see that these, these verses tie right into Malachi, tie right into the prophets back there. These are not things that apply to you today. Okay? You may face tribulations and trials, but it's not God-given tribulation and trials. He didn't prophesy that to you. Okay? You're at peace with God, according to Jesus Christ. He's, he's on terms of peace with the world through Jesus Christ right now, not imputing trespasses unto men. 
by offering a ministry of reconciliation. Jesus, God's saying, I will be friends if you will be friends, right? He's not saying, judgment, 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 hope you endure, you know. That's not what's going on. That's what he was doing in the refinement process of Israel, all right? And so, meanwhile, mo moving on here, uh, let, let's look back in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. <clears throat> And we see in the first, we've covered verse 2 and 3, I think, pretty much in detail here. Uh, let's move on to verse 4, Malachi 3, 4. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. We've seen that in prophecies after the purging, after the refinement, and when, the, when what remains is the remnant and salvation comes, what they offer will be, will be pleasant to the Lord. We saw it in Ezekiel chapter 20, right? It'll be pleasant. Um, and then it says, as in the days of old, as in the former years. That days of old, uh, I won't go into it right now, but it's also prophetic language. Uh, the days of old in Israel referred to the times when God made the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the olden days, the days when God delivered them out from Egypt and provided for them in the wilderness and gave them that law, okay, and they entered the promised land when God was fulfilling his promises in the days of old. He says it will be in the future. Just as in the days of old, it'll happen in the future. He will fulfill his promises. So you read back there in Deuteronomy 32, and part of the law was that the elders, the elders, would communicate to the children the things that God did in Israel in the days of old, would pass down to their progeny what God said in the law, and by reminding them of, of who God is and his promises and his ability to keep those promises, they would be faithful. When they do not pass that along and don't remind your children about the days of old and what God did, you know what happens? Rebelliousness, right? We'll see that in Malachi 4 come up again when it talks about turning the heart of the fathers to the children and back and forth. They don't remember the days of old. They're going about their own way. Okay? And so uh, Micah chapter 7 verse 14 talks about God uh, reestablishing his covenant like in the days of old with Israel. And Amos chapter 9 talks about him building again the tabernacle of David as in the days of old. And so again, this is prophetic language where he will, as in the days of old, build a temple, bring them back to the land, uh, do miracles even greater when we read back in Exodus. Okay? And so Malachi 3 verse 4 says, the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant as in the days of old. People say that Old Testament stuff, that's not going to happen anymore. Jesus was sacrificed, that temple is used, there's not going to be a literal temple. No, it's going to be as in the days of old. A literal temple, literal provision, God on the earth. Okay? And so it's going to be as in the days of old, only a little bit greater, as Haggai says. And so Malachi 3 verse 4 says, it'll be as in the days of old in the former years. And uh, in verse uh, 5, and before we do this, let's go to Ezekiel 44. I think you'll enjoy this. We talked about as in the days of old. We've been to Ezekiel 43 once. And if you study Ezekiel 40 to 48, it's really fascinating because you read there about how God will reestablish it as in the days of old. And part of that reestablishment is the building of the temple the, uh, and the reinstituting of the priesthood. See, I thought Jesus was the priest. Well, he's the high priest. I mean, you don't see a high priest in Ezekiel. You don't need a high priest when he's already the high priest offering his blood. But, you know, the high priest wasn't the only priest in Israel. You had other priests. And he made a covenant. If you remember last week and two weeks ago, we studied a covenant, a promise God made with the Levites to preserve them forever. So why would he get rid of them? So he's going to preserve them. In Ezekiel 44, you see where the sons of Levi, who after their purging come through and refined as silver and gold will have a place at the Lord's table, a literal table it describes it, it's made out of wood apparently the guy's a mountain man or something, the Lord's a mountain he's got the table, Lord's table there, and they're eating at the table with the Lord, Ezekiel 44 verse 15, the priests of the Levites, the son of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me they shall come near to me to minister unto me and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God so here's offerings made by Levites in the Millennial Kingdom to the Lord God, who we know would be the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Verse 16, they shall enter into my sanctuary, they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. You read down the rest of the chapter, it's fascinating because it describes these Levites. It says they'll enter the gates in verse 17 of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, no wool shall come upon them. Uh, in verse 18, they shall have linen bonnets upon their heads. They shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And so uh, there goes, that's interesting closing there. When they go forth into the outer court, the, even the outer court to the people, they shall put off their garments. And it talks about all these regulations of these priests. If you drop down to uh, oh, 23, 
They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's exactly what the pre Levitical priests in Malachi were not doing. The people who God cursed in Malachi 2 is going to be fulfilled in these righteous priests right here. Ezekiel 44. Because they're going to teach the righteousness of the law. In verse 24, in the controversy, they shall stand in judgment. They shall judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes, my assemblies. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be holy. It's going to be what God intended. This is God's kingdom on earth, and the Levites are a part of it. And they're ministering to the Lord. You know, if the Messiah is on the earth and he's sitting in Jerusalem, only so many people can be close to it, folks. Okay. The Levites are there. They've been given the promise. All right. Ezekiel 44, verse 25, they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves. Uh, it says that in verse 26, they'll be clean. And uh, down in verse 29, they'll eat, in verse 29, they shall eat the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. The Levites. Why would you offer offerings in the kingdom? Well, how are the Levites going to eat? They have no land. Right? Well, I thought Jesus was a, a priest. He's, he's sitting in Jerusalem. He's the high priest offering the blood of the New Testament. And the Levitical priests serve him. And they get to eat of the meat offerings that everyone else brings to, to, to Jerusalem. Okay? So there's a system set up there. An actual kingdom. A, 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 a control. A political structure. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen for a thousand years. And then even beyond that. Okay, and of course it will change after a thousand years to be even more eternal. So you see that happening. Look back at Malachi chapter 3 in verse 5 and 6. It says, I will come near to you in judgment, to judgment. I will be swift witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers and the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, say the Lord of hosts. He'll come back and judge. He'll purge all these away. All will remain will be holy. And the reason why he's going to come back and do this, the reason why he says, Behold, I will come and judge. The reason why he says, I'll come and make things holy as in the days of old, is because of verse 6, where he says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, when he says sons of Jacob there, he's not talking about these cursed people. He's not talking about the sorcerers, adulterers, and the, the oppressors in verse 5. He's talking about the nation. Right? He's talking about, I'm going to preserve a remnant, the faithful. Okay, there will be people preserved, but it's not going to be these folks here who do wickedness. But he is the Lord, and he changes not. Uh, which is a fascinating verse, and we'll spend the, the, the rest of few minutes tonight just dealing with this. Um, because this is, this is a verse, amongst others, that is used against those of us who teach that God gives different instructions at different times about different things. God changes his instructions. There's more than one gospel in the Bible. He changes what he's saying. His dealings with humanity change. And they quote, no, God doesn't change. Look at Malachi one verse or Malachi three verse six, Hebrews thirteen eight. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. Right, and here we are saying we need to rightly divide uh, Jesus' earthly ministry from Jesus' ministry to Paul. And so they, they quote these verses to you. Understand, these are not talking about what God is doing at a specific time. We know that we've studied already before how in a single verse it was talking about Jesus' peaceful earthly ministry and Jesus' return in judgment and vengeance. God wasn't doing the same thing, right? We have to discern between the two. At one time, God was offering salvation to the world, and the next thing you know, he's flooding the whole earth. He's not doing the same thing all the time, all right? And so when it says the Lord, he's the Lord, he changes not, it's referring here to a few things. Um, one thing that doesn't change about God is his nature. God's nature never changes. He's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's eternal. That never changes. You can't change the nature of a thing. It is what it is. It's what it means to be a nature. You can't change the fact that you're human. You can't turn yourself into a rock at will. You can't do that. You're a human being, okay? And, and so God is God. You can't change his nature. You can't make him a man, right? You also can't change God's character. He's loving. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He's holy. He's just. He's perfect. You can't change his character, all right? You can't change his attributes, uh, the, 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 the qualities of God. You can't change the things that he can do. And the last thing, which is the context here, is God does not change when he makes a promise. He is not a man that he should lie. He will keep it. Right? When God sets out to do something and says, I guarantee it will happen, he will get it done. Okay? He will not change his promises. And so we read in Titus 1, verse 2, that God, who cannot lie, says, is there something God can't do? Well, yeah, there's lots of things he can't do. He can't sin. He can't lie. He can't commit murder. Right? He can't break any law. Like, he is righteousness. 
And so God can't do that. He can't lie in Titus 1 verse 2. Numbers 23 19 says the same thing. God is not a man that he should lie. Men can lie. Men can disobey. That's your nature. Right? You can do that. You can do right. You can do wrong. God can't do wrong. See, that's his nature. So that's what doesn't change about him. And so when Malachi comes along and they, and they say, you know, where's this God of judgment? He's not going to come and judge evil. That's against God's nature. It's against his character. He must do that. Him being the God of all creation, when he sees wickedness, he must do right. Right? And his holiness and his justice means he's going to judge it. Okay? Now, in his long suffering, he may put that off for a little bit, but he, he's not going to put it off forever. He's got to deal with it. Okay? His attributes never change. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. There are people who teach uh, about Jesus when he was born in the manger that he voluntarily laid aside the free and independent exercise of his deity attributes, that he was somehow less than God, that he couldn't do what God could do. He didn't have the attributes of God. False. Heresy. Wrong. Malachi 3, Mark chapter 1, verse 2 says Jesus Christ was the God that came to earth. John 1 says he just put on humanity, like he was putting on a coat. Right? He never ceased to be God. Now, what you saw was a man, right? But he was God manifest in the flesh. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, we read in verse 8 here. <clears throat> By the way, this, these are another set of verses that are changed in, in, other, in some other Bibles that you may have. In Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Right? He always was. He is now. He always will be. That's God. He's beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's God. All right? Who is this guy in Revelation 1 verse 8? Well, it's the same guy in Revelation 1, verse 11. When John hears this guy speaking, and he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, he turns around in verse 12 to see the voice which spake unto him. And when he turned in verse 18, this guy says, he, he, he describes this fellow here who's got like skin like brass and white hair and things like that. But down in verse 18, he says, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, who is that? It's Jesus Christ. Right? That's Jesus Christ, who became a man, who lived, died, and now he's forevermore. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I was, I am, and to come. Jesus was not created at his birth. He did not come into existence from Mary. He always was. His, he just put on humanity. Right? The human cells begin with Mary. He's always God. Okay? He's always God. That never changes. The Lord never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Jesus Christ is not only a man. He's also God. Okay? You're only a man and always will be only a man. Okay? God, you are not. Jesus was. And so we need to understand some of these things uh, so we don't get tripped up about Malachi 1 verse 6. Um, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why does it say that? Does it say that so that when someone comes and says you need to rightly divide the word of truth like Paul does, you can quote this and say, oh, you're wrong. That's not why it exists. Okay? Hebrews 13 is talking about these, these Hebrews who are facing tribulations, facing afflictions. He's encouraging them to continue on to endure through these afflictions. Why? Because Jesus Christ, the one that you serve, the one that you follow, is the same yesterday, today, forever. He said he's with you all way. He said that he's going to return. He said that he'll provide for you. It will happen. Right? So in Hebrews 13, uh, in verse 6, so that we may boldly say... Uh, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, be not carried about with diverse strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meats, which have, and it goes on to describe this doctrine here. What Jesus said was true, is what he said. He's the Son of God. That statement in Hebrews 13, 8 is dealing with Jesus Christ's divinity, his being God, his never-changingness. All right? Romans chapter 11, verse 29, Paul says the same thing. The Paul that you learn how to rightly divide from, the Paul that teaches you the mystery of Christ kept secret from the foundation of the world, says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind about what he's doing. Okay? And he says that in the very context when he says in verse 26, all Israel shall be saved as it is written. And he quotes prophecy. And he says, this is my covenant unto them, Israel, and I shall take away their sins. 
And he says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God does not forget his promises. And people want us to think today that God has, has thrown the trash his promises to Israel and replaced it entirely with you and I, who are not Israel. Okay? That's not what scripture says. That's when you quote Hebrews 13, 8. That's when you quote Malachi 3, verse 6, say, the Lord doesn't change. Okay? Uh, look, look at... Uh, Look at James. You know what? I need to read to you from Lamentations. Lamentations in your Bible. Let's go back to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 2. God will not go back in his promise, by the way, whether he promises you evil or promises you good, he will not go back on it. Okay? Lamentations chapter 2. That's why you want to get on God's good side, by the way. That's why you'd be uh, good to, to receive his grace. Uh, Lamentations 2, 17. Lamentations, of course, is a book. You can always remember what it's about because the name itself has the word lament in it. And Jeremiah is writing this book as a lament, a weeping, because he's standing in the midst of rubble, which used to be Jerusalem, because the enemies came and destroyed it. Uh, of course, why did they destroy it? Because of the sins of Israel. Why did God destroy it? Because the covenant said, when you sin and sin and sin, I'm going to judge. Right? So Lamentations 2.17, Jeremiah writes, The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. So even in the, in the, the rubble, Jeremiah goes, God did what he said he would do. Right? I don't like it, but he said he would do it, and he did it. Which means God is true, he never changes, and we're wicked sinners down here. That's what he learned from the rubble. He doesn't curse God. He doesn't say, oh, God's so hateful, you know. No, he says God did what he said he would do. If we just know what he said he was going to do, we would have known this. He says, he hath thrown down, hath not pitied, he hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversaries, which is what the law said he would do. Back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh -huh. Look at Lamentations 3, verse 22. Yeah. Jeremiah still is alive, even though Jerusalem is rubble. And he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. And then he quotes, how great thou art. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Right? How could you say that, Jeremiah? Amidst your whole city is destroyed. People have been, have been killed. And he says, because God warned us, he said it was going to happen, and he did it just like he said he would happen. Right? God is always true. God never changes. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. You can trust him to do that. When God speaks, I would listen, and I would follow, and I would believe, and I would do what he says. That's what the lesson here is. So he says, because of the Lord's mercy, that Israel, the sons of Jacob, are not wiped off the earth. Because he made a promise. Great is his faithfulness to do what he says he would do. And if that means he's going to destroy Jerusalem, that, so be it. If that means, Romans chapter 4, he's going to give you eternal life by God's grace, you know what that means? Praise God, he's going to do it. Right? You can learn that assurance from Lamentations 3 because God is faithful. He's never gone back on his word. And he's given you a word uh, according to the grace of God. Okay, James chapter 1, verse 17. James says the same thing to, to Israel when he says that every good thing uh, comes down from above. And man, people distort that verse. You can get more about it in our, in our verse by verse in James. But... Um, James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, which whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So there's no turning to this guy. He doesn't one day face this direction, the other day he's over here totally different. You know, he's the same guy today, yesterday, and forever. And he's made a promise to Israel, as James is alluding to, and he does not forget about it. He calls him the Father of lights. What lights is he talking about? Anybody know? Sun, moon, and stars. And you say, well, so what? Okay, well, I don't believe in literal creation. Well, <laughs> uh, you don't believe the Bible, but not only that, but you understand that James 1.17, that creation verse there, is not referring to Genesis, even though God did create that. It's referring to Jeremiah chapter 33. In Jeremiah 33, the prophet says that if the sun, moon, and stars cease to exist, then God will forget his promise he made to Israel. Right? So as long as you see those lights up there, you know that God will keep his promise, is what Jeremiah 33 says. That's what James 1.17 says. So Jeremiah 33, verse 14, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised in the house of Israel, to the house of Judah. Or reading this, by the way, have in your mind Romans 8 and 9. Because we're going to go back there eventually. 
When Paul says that you have all spiritual blessings today, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, and Israel's fallen, and they haven't received their kingdom, keep in your mind this, because people read through Romans and say, God's not dealing with Israel anymore. Right? And Jeremiah 33, 14 says, The days come that I will perform that good thing that I promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land, on the earth. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith he shall be called, The Lord our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. There will never be lacking the son of David on the throne in the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests of the Levites want a man before me to offer burnt offerings to kindle me. There won't be a lack of Levites. There's going to be the son of David. There's going to be the son of Levites. And they'll be pure. And they'll be holy. And they'll be in Israel. Verse 19 says, the, verse 18 says, they will do sacrifice continually. We read that in Ezekiel 44. The, uh, Malachi 3 began with two messengers, the son of David, the son of Levi. Right? They're going to prepare the way of the Lord. And this is the way of the Lord right here. Jeremiah 33, 19 says, The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, If you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. So it's not just with David, it's with the priesthood. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither seat the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. Moreover, uh, it goes on to explain here the promise. You see these passages here? As long as there's day, as long as there's night, God will bring back the Levitical priesthood, and he will have someone sitting on the throne of David on the earth, reigning and ruling. Okay? That's amazing. And now you can understand, knowing Romans 8 and 9, why when Paul says Israel's not having their kingdom today, people would object. <laughs> wait a minute. I still see the sun and stars. I, wait a minute. There's still a covenant here. Even though we're, you know, we sinned, he still made a promise. What's going to happen then? Okay. So I'm going to leave it there tonight. I wanted to get to that point so that we can uh, have that in our minds going, going back to Romans. Any, any questions on that?